uh, e romana e no reo e rau ranga tira mā tēnei te mihi kia koutou e te kaupapa o te rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa uh, Good evening everyone um, Some of you watched me scurry across the square because I was uh, <laughs> late and, uh, and that just reflects a, a very busy day and makes a mockery and a lie of the opening statement of my speech which is I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight um, <laughs> I'm not actually grateful for the opportunity to speak tonight, but it's such a, a warm welcome and friendly audience um, that I'm feeling comforted by that and knowing that there is such a great team of people speaking. And I said to Rachel Fonatier when I came in, how am I gonna talk about leadership when you're speaking? Um, and she said, well, at least uh, if you speak first, you won't be able to correct me. So <laughs> I would never do a thing like that to my friend Rachel. Um, and Billy, of course, who has carried on a tradition that very much links us and takes us back to that time a decade ago, uh, when uh, a young guy, and I guess there's, there's no, I know that this is a true story, a young guy um, rang the civil defence and said, I'd like to volunteer. And they said, are you a trained volunteer? And he said, oh, I haven't done any training. And they said, thanks very much, but no thank you. And so he rang Red Cross and he said, uh, can I volunteer to help? I really want to help. And they said, are you trained as a volunteer? And they said, no. They said, well, thank you, because he said no. And they said, thank you very much, but no, thank you. And so he went home and wrote a post on Facebook saying to all of the students in Canterbury, you want to volunteer to help out? Um, uh, the only precondition that I'm putting on you is that you are not trained as a volunteer. <laughs> so, um, and, and it's great to see the, the sort of the co-papa of giving back uh, and paying it forward very much now embedded in the curriculum of Canterbury University. Um, so I guess my story starts a decade ago with the Canterbury earthquake sequence and uh, I learned a lot of new words at that time, uh, liquefaction and lateral spread. I'm not ashamed to, not, to say, I didn't know what either of them were. Um, but they, the earthquake sequence and what happened afterwards taught me to understand words that I thought I knew but actually didn't know very well at all and so, so it turned out. And those three words are community, resilience, and leadership. And um, it, it's interesting because when I left Parliament, my staff gave me a, uh, a, 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 bee, a set of beads, and it had three, a necklace with, with three small beads uh, that said community, resilience, and leadership. And the middle one was a quote from a famous philosopher, and I'll try and get this right. Um, it said uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 it was about courage. Um, the, you see, this is terrible, because I shouldn't do things that I haven't actually written down, because I'll forget them. But it was, it was along the lines of that the, the, most, uh, the most courageous act um, of all is to, um, uh, is to think for yourself um, allowed. And uh, when you think about the significance of um, thinking for yourself aloud, uh, it means giving voice to the, to the expression of your feelings, uh, your emotions, or even your criticism or challenge of what's going on, speaking truth to power. And when you link that to what I now understand about community, resilience and leadership, uh, the connection for me is a very powerful message. Community is not the co-location of houses, that's a suburb. Uh, I'm pretty clear about that. Uh, what community I've learned is the, is the relationship between the people in those houses and their connection with decision makers, whether it's central or local government. Uh, and of course, uh, communities don't have to be just geographic. Communities can be communities of identity, communities of interest. Uh, and, uh, but the social capital of a community is not measured by their socioeconomic status, it's measured by the relationships between and with um, decision makers and, um, and others who can influence uh, change in their, in their lives. 
Uh, resilience is not about being strong in the face of adversity, that's stoicism. So people who come to the city and say you're all so resilient uh, get the appropriate response from the people of Christchurch, which is, um, you know, no. Uh, and for me, resilience is very much not a destination, but a journey. It's a way of doing. It's about building resilience. And because you can't possibly predict with any certainty what's going to happen, what adversity we might face, um, resilience actually has to mean uh, so much more than, um, than the ability to uh, uh, prepare and plan for an event, absorb and um, respond. It is also about um, adapting and changing and, if necessary, co-creating a new normal, which is a different uh, set of skills. And resilience, for me, is very much a part of a commitment that we make to each other, rather than something that uh, is something that, that is simply reflect, reflected as a, as a destination. And then we come to leadership. Leadership is not a position. It's a characteristic that's based on certain qualities. And I remember going to a young people's uh, forum uh, where they were asked to describe leadership and they used um, all of the words that uh, you would normally see in a, in a textbook, um, strong, decisive, committed, authoritative, inspiring and responsible. The only one that I actually connected with was inspiring, but um, the uh, but but in many respects, what they described was the heroic form of leadership. You know, the ability to take charge uh, to, for command and control to um, take over. And I have to say that in the emergency response period, following a disaster, people often look for that form of leadership because it actually can be quietly comforting to know that somebody's in charge and know what they're doing. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, and unfortunately there are people who take charge who don't know what they're doing, and that the consequences, uh, I'll leave it to your imagination as to whether we actually know anything about that. Um, but there is another way to define leadership. And this definition ties in with my experience about what happens after the crisis is over, the immediate crisis, and we begin that process of, of recovery. And I think the word that marks a real leader is the word trust. And trust is just one of those characteristics that you cannot do without. Um, it is hard won, but easily lost. Uh, and it is something, though, that, that does have to be earned, but as I say, can be challenged every step of the way. The, the qualities that engender trust are wisdom, courage, faith, empathy, moderation, and justice. And I'm reading from a list that I saw put on a, on a slide once. And it was interesting because they sound like a set of virtues to me, and they are. That was the description of a virtuous leader, but for me it was a description of what is a leader. Um, and all of these uh, um, are important, and it creates in my mind the distinction between the heroic leader and the real leader. It's not about taking charge, it's about engaging others in a way that enables them to lead in their own right. And that's why the broader community leadership that we're going to hear about tonight is so important. It's an important part of the mix. Um, and uh, uh, so true leadership in that respect is uh, respectful, engaging, empathetic, inclusive and intuitive. But it also requires humility and courage. Uh, and that is exactly the kind of leader we need in a post-disaster recovery environment. But we also now know it's exactly the kind of leader we need to lead the response to the most unimaginable crisis. The terrorist attacks of March 15 last year is not something that I think anyone would have expected to see. Someone asked me the other day, you know, what was your initial response? And it was disbelief absolute disbelief that it could happen here, uh, let alone in New Zealand itself. Um, but that simple image, um, well, well, empathetic leadership took centre stage, uh, which absolutely set the scene for what was an extraordinary response. And that simple image of our Prime Minister wearing a headscarf, um, her pain and her compassion visible to all, captured the essence of empathy, just in that one shot. 
um, but she offered comfort and hope from a position of integrity, um, and integrity is an important part of building trust. Her words captured that, um, uh, 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 her words captured that whole um, thing, I'm not putting this very well, but she embraced the Muslim community not as others when she said, um, but, 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 but as, as, as one with all New Zealanders. So she, 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 she rejected the, 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 the definition of others and embraced us all as uh, New Zealanders together. Um, and uh, the phrase that she used, they are us, uh, was a phrase to reject the idea that they weren't us, <laughs> um, that we were uh, one in that regard. And I think empathy is an intangible quality, but it means that those most deeply affected by what had occurred knew that our Prime Minister was there for them no matter what, and that she knew exactly how we all felt Everyone felt understood and affirmed, and I think that is core critical as well. Empathy is founded in humanity, the very essence of who we are. Uh, the Muslim community responded in kind. Uh, it was an extraordinary response, and the day that I will never forget is standing in, uh, in Hagley Park, South Hagley Park, one week after the shooting, opposite the mosque, with the call to prayer, and thousands of Christchurch people turned up. They weren't invited, they turned up because they wanted to be there in order to express their support and love for their fellow uh, community members um, and to stand in solidarity with them. We've got your back was an incredibly powerful, powerful message. And every single member of the Muslim community that I spoke to on that day spoke to me about how much that meant to them. And I think this was all enabled in the environment uh, that was created by our Prime Minister. Um, and then the wider community responded in the same way. I, I remember thinking the night before, um, well, the, the, the night of the um, attacks, that people would want to do something, that there would be an instinctive response that people would want to come together. And so of that, we chose the um, Botanic Gardens as the place for a for a tribute wall so that if people wanted to bring something, they would have somewhere to go. What we hadn't anticipated was that that would become the location for all of the international media. So while the international story was being told of the most awful um, circumstances and the trauma that had been imposed on the Muslim community and the city, the backdrop was this growing expression, a day-by-day -day growing expression of love, compassion and unity, uh, the complete opposite of what had driven um, that. So I, just, I, I guess that was my way of articulating for you um, my experience in terms of uh, what leading from the heart means but what it can mean to the wider community. And I'll let others tell other bits of the same story. Kia ora koutou katoa.